So this is really going to be more about biological mechanism than personalized medicine. Um, but we are working on medical projects where we are trying to understand mechanisms involved in disease. So um, it's not completely uh, random, I hope. And the te techniques are actually highly related to techniques you've been learning about already with, uh, I think you've been learning about the Bayesian GP LVM um, and these kind of things. So I'm going to talk about Gaussian processes. So just as a kind of motivation, um, we're very interested in um, transcription, so gene expression, and how that's regulated. So transcription is a highly dynamic process. Um, here I've shown some RNA polymerase, which is uh, a molecule involved in producing RNA transcripts from the genome. And here's some expression mRNA data. And this is a time course. And you can see these peak times of this production uh, signal here. And then you get these kind of uh, response peaks here. And what you can see is that the uh, effect of turning on a gene can be very variable across different genes. So a gene that's a direct target of some in this case, it's a hormone. So you hit a cell with some hormone, and then the cell is switched on. Some genes will switch on 24 hours later than other genes, even though they're direct targets of the hormone. And we want to understand what are the processes regulating that kind of very varied dynamical response uh, to stimulation of the cell. So I'm going to give some background on uh, Gaussian processes shamelessly stealing lots of material from Neil. But when you co-author with someone, you can nick all their stuff, because you're also an author. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to talk about three applications. Uh, I'm going to talk about polymerase elongation dynamics. So that's uh, where you're producing a RNA molecule and transcribing it from genomic DNA and the kind of elongation dynamics. And there's some. Uh, data about that these days that you can use to fit these models. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the previous figure where we link that to RNA profiles. I'm going to finish off with some older material, but I kind of like these regulatory network models, so, so I, I want to include it because the methodology is very similar, even though the work's not quite as new. So I think you probably had an intro. No, you've not had an intro on Gaussian processes. You've just been using them. You don't care what they are. You just use them. They work. Anyway, I'll tell you what they are now. So um, they're probability distributions over functions. So Gaussian distribution is a probability distribution over numbers or vectors. And a Gaussian process is a generalization of that to functions. And the shape or features of these functions that you generate from this distribution are determined by something called the covariance function. So this is a kind of parameter of a Gaussian process in the same way as uh, the covariance matrix is a parameter of a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And the covariance function determines whether your functions are changing a lot, so if they're very dynamic, or if they're smooth, they could be smooth, infinitely differentiable analytic functions, or they could be rough Markov stochastic processes. Um, they could be stationary and non-stationary, periodic or chaotic. And um, the covariance function really gives us those properties. So this is a very flexible model over a kind of space of functions. So. Here's an example of a draw from not a Gaussian process, but a Gaussian distribution. So we have a 25-dimensional multivariate Gaussian distribution, but with a very specific choice of covariance matrix. OK, so a covariance matrix tells you about the correlations of different variables in the vector, uh, different elements of the vector. So we have 25 dimensions, and this high band on the diagonal basically tells me that elements of this vector which are closer to each other are more highly correlated. 
So we have this kind of correlation structure for the vector. So if I draw a single sample from this multivariate Gaussian distribution, that's a vector with 25 elements. So I just draw that from a random number generator, and I get a sample that looks like this. And you can see that this is, if I join those dots, it's starting to look like a curve rather than a vector. Okay, so I can think of this in the limit where 25 goes to infinity as a function. Now here, this is just also vectors, but now selecting many more elements so they look like curves. So in the computer, these are generated again as multivariate Gaussian random variables. Um, it's best to choose a collaborator to generate these functions. Um, <laughs> And uh, here, the, uh, instead of having a covariance matrix, we now have a covariance function, which tells us what the correlation of points here is, depending on what their, uh, so if these are time series, we can call along the x-axis t here. So it's the distance here, and this is the correlation. And this covariance function here has a hyperparameter l, which is a length scale here. So if L is large, then these things don't cross the zero line so often. But if L becomes small, then they wiggle a lot. So this parameter of this covariance function gives us the properties of these functions. So that's a way you can do modeling with these kind of Gaussian processes by choosing these parameters of the covariance function. Okay, so we can do this, uh, so I guess the most standard application of these is regression. Okay, so that's kind of a very nice application where you can do things exactly in terms of inference. So there's some underlying curve that I want to learn. So let's say that I'm trying to, that I've got some gene expression time course data that I'm going to generate. So I'm Bayesian, so I already have a belief about this before I've even done the experiment. And that's captured by my prior. So my prior is, well, I've let, read lots of books about gene expression time course. I know the kind of wiggles that I expect to see, so I can hallucinate some uh, data here. You know? So I think that I'm going to see some time course and it's going to be some wiggly sort of thing, and it's going to be smooth because I'm averaging over a population of cells. If I see one data point here, and the data is very clean, so there's a very small error in it, then my belief becomes constrained by the data. But I don't know what happens away from the data. So again, I just have this kind of wiggly uh, functions here. As I see more data, I become more constrained by the data. And so my uncertainty here, my posterior, so these are the marginal posterior um, standard deviations. These are kind of becoming big away from the data. And then if I have quite a lot of data, I can see that actually this is a sine wave here. Um, so these are methods for doing non-parametric regression. And it's kind of a machine learning audience, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much. I guess this is Gaussian Processes uh, 101. OK, but we're applying them in a slightly different context. So that might be new to people with machine learning background. So first example I talk about is modeling this RNA polymerase elongation. OK. So Eukaryotic genes are transcribed, or most of them are transcribed by RNA polymerase 2, uh, which we're going to call POL2. Okay? And POL2 is recruited to the beginning of the gene, called the promoter. And it moves down the gene along the DNA, producing a pre-mRNA molecule which is the precursor to the mature mRNA. Um, so POL2 comes down here, and then it moves along the DNA. And it moves along at a few kb per minute kind of velocity. And eukaryotic genes are quite big often. 
And that means that this transcription process can take a long time. So typically, for a sort of typical length gene, it's going to take about 20 minutes. For some genes, it can take hours, okay, because they're very long. For some genes, it can take one minute because they're very short. But there's also ways that the speed of elongation can be regulated. So we're kind of interested in inferring from data how fast elongation is happening. And also, looking at this polymerase um, data gives us a far more immediate view of how the cell is responding to some stimulation that's switching on gene expression. Because gene expression happens after this, so it can be delayed by a very long time when you actually see your data. So if you're looking at time course gene expression data and you see a gene come up, it may have been activated a few hours ago. Yeah, so polymerase really gives you the immediate kind of data about the gene being switched on. So if you're inferring how genes are regulated, then that's quite important information that's missing if you're just using gene expression data. So we're looking at uh, breast cancer cells stimulated by uh, estradiol. So, so basically this is about how estrogen affects breast cancer cells. And these MCF7 cells are estrogen responsive. Okay, so this is a model of how estrogen affects uh, transcription. We're using a technique called uh, CHIP-seq to measure the amount of Pol2 that's bound at different genomic locations. And this is a very kind of noisy assay, so you get quite noisy data. But basically, you get a bunch of sequence reads which are kind of more dense around regions where you have a lot of Pol2. But it's very noisy data here, so you get a lot of kind of uh, uh, anomalous looking kind of peaks along here. And we have a time series of these experiments. So we have eight time points, and these uh, different lines here are different time points. And in this example, the promoter is here on the right-hand side, and the cells are stimulated with estrogen, and then um, a, a nuclear receptor called estrogen receptor comes into the nucleus and switches on transcription. And this is a target gene, and so the middle of the gene is kind of filling out with polymerase, and then it's clearing out as the polymerase has moved through and gene expression has stopped. But it's not very easy to see what's going on here because it's very noisy and there are lots of artifacts in the data and so on. So it's kind of noisy data, but it's valuable information to know when the genes are switched on. So we want to kind of model this in order to clean up the data and, and work out what's really going on. So we just bin the gene region into five bins. And within each bin, we simply count the number of sequence reads and use that as a measure of the density of polymerase in that bin. Okay, so we create five time series for different regions of the gene. Whoops. Um, and these are the five time series here. Sorry for people in the back, you probably can't see these. Um, and what you can't maybe see here is that they're slightly delayed relative to one another because of the time it takes for the polymerase to move from the beginning of the gene to the end of the gene. So there's a time delay um, here relative to here because the signal, because the polymerase actually had to move along. And so when you look at the time series, they're slightly shifted relative to one another. And we want to build a model to learn those uh, delays between different segments along the genome. So we want to find the response of genes. We want to model the elongation speed along the genome. And we're also interested in these activity profiles of the promoter because we can use them to try and understand how gene expression is regulated at the promoter. So we're going to cluster that as well. So the model is, is fairly simple. Um, 
what we do is we model the promoter activity of polymerase changing in time as a Gaussian process. Okay, so we use this flexible non-parametric model. That's this uh, blue curve here. And then the data is modeled as a time-delayed version of the promoter activity. Okay, so there's a time lag here. Um, tau. And then we also model a sort of spreading out of the signal over time through a, a Gaussian kernel here. And that models the fact that you have a cell population and then you stimulate it with um, estrogen. And so at the beginning, all the cells are very synchronized. But we're monitoring things over a long time. So after an hour or two, the cells are going to become a little bit less synchronized. And what you see is a bit of a spreading out, really, of the signal. So we're going to model that by having this Gaussian kernel here, which models this spreading out over time of the signal. Um, and then we're going to do inference over D, which models the time it takes to get down each segment of the genome, of, of this gene region. And we're going to do this all with Bayesian MCMC uh, Hamilton Monte Carlo. And it's pretty noisy data, so the inference isn't very uh, clear cut. But you can get some nice results. So here's an example. Here's our data points here. This is our inferred Gaussian process function at the promoter. And then this is the delayed versions in each of these regions. And this is the inferred time it takes to reach the first 20%, the first 40%, first 60%, first 80% of the gene. So we don't assume any kind of constant velocity because it's not thought that elongation is necessarily a constant velocity process. You can get pausing and things. So we don't put that in the model. We just model the delay to reach each segment as an independent parameter with no constraints. Um, and actually, we use the fact that if we infer them to be sequential, we actually use that as a filter also to see that the model is fitting well. So we don't put that into the model. So there's nothing in the model to say that this inference can be preceding this one. That just comes out of it. And then we use this to model the velocity of transcription in different target genes. And it's sort of all within the ballpark of previous estimates, uh, but you do get some very rapid uh, response genes. Um, and I think when we did this, this was quantifying this elongation speed for the most number of targets that people had done. Whoops. Uh oh. I don't think it's hit anything electrical. Um, and then we can look at the promoter. Uh, clusters, so the cluster promoter activities, and we can look to see if regulating transcription factors are implicated in different shapes of response. And we found, for instance, that a pioneer factor, FOXA1, is enriched close to the very rapidly responding target genes. And this would be hard to see for genes which take a long time to tr transcribe using gene expression data. So this polymerase really gives you some nice resolution on really rapid kind of events that only take a few minutes after estrogen hits the cells, which you wouldn't really get from the gene expression data. OK, so that's uh, elongation dynamics. But we also have RNA-seq data from the system. So the way the experiment was done is they took the cell population, they split it in half, did polymerase chip-seq on half, and RNA-seq on the other half. So we have RNA data from exactly the same samples as the POL2 data. So to model that, we use a differential equation approach because that allows us to model production and degradation rates. So we're going to move away from a discrete time uh, model to a continuous time model. So the referees asked us to make a cartoon. Uh, which is really good, actually, because it's a great slide now. But, um, oh, referees. <laughs> anyway, uh, so 
we have our polymerase chip seek data. So that's the same data I was talking about before. But now I'm interested in the time between the release of the polymer of the release of the pre-mRNA and production of mature RNA. So I'm no longer going to talk about elongation time. So I'm going to forget about the polymerase in the first 80% of the gene and focus just on the polymerase in the last 20% of the gene. So the last of those time series I showed before. Now that, um, the polymerase is producing pre-mRNA which is the RNA containing all the intronic sequence, which is then spliced out to produce uh, one or more mature RNAs. And our RNA-seq allows us to quantify the mature RNAs. We also get some intronic sequence, which I'll talk about also. Now, the polymerase might have a profile like this. And then the RNA can have several profiles depending on certain parameters. And one important parameter is the half-life of the mRNA. So if the mRNA is very stable, then, so the orange one here is a stable RNA. And for a stable RNA, the peak of the RNA is a little bit later than the blue one, which is an unstable short half-life RNA. So if you have a very short half-life, the target RNA here responds in a very similar way to the polymerase. If you have a more stable mRNA, the peak is delayed by, you know, 20, 30 minutes or so. But when we were modeling our data, um, we found that the simple model that we used initially didn't really fit too well. And we observed what looked like delays in the system. So if you have some delay between pol 2 producing the RNA, you can also parameterize that as a delay parameter. That's this delta here. I'll show this bigger in the next slide. And that can also lead the peak to be shifted, but the profile looks different. So we're interested in kind of identifying these sort of delays in transcription because they look significant for a proportion of our genes. Um, and Another backstory is, I guess, that splicing here, where the RNA is processed into these uh, shorter mature RNAs, that can happen at the same time as elongation. At the same time as you're transcribing the pre-mRNA, you can be splicing out and producing the mature RNAs. And people think that's the canonical, most common way for splicing to happen. But they always say it happens in about 80% of cases. And we found these big delays in a small number of cases. So it may not always happen co-transcriptionally. It can also happen after transcription. And then the question is how long it takes. So these are the kind of questions I'm going to address. So the model is that we produce mRNA in a rate that's proportional to our polymerase signal P but with a time delay, which we're going to infer, and then we have a degradation rate for the mRNA. So the model parameters here that we're interested in are the delay and the degradation rate. And we showed a few years ago that if you have a linear differential equation like this and you model this driving function as a, Gauss, as a draw from a Gaussian process, then you can work out the likelihood of the system exactly. And that still holds if it's time delayed also. So if you have a time delay system like this, you can work out the likelihood exactly. Now you still have to do a bit of work to infer these hyperparameters alpha and delta, and we use MCMC for that. But the number of hyperparameters isn't too bad, so you can still do that genome-wide. Uh, it takes a bit of time, but it's not completely intractable. So let's show some example fits. So the, the data doesn't look like that. It'd be nice if it did. Um, it looks like this. It's very messy and noisy. Um, and so I'm going to show some examples of fits for these genes, which are becoming increasingly delayed in the Pol2, A through to F. And so here's a kind of early response gene 
with no indication of delay. So we've inferred this delay parameter. This is a posterior distribution of the delay. There's no evidence of a delay for that one. Then we have a gene here which does look kind of delayed. So this would have been one of our problematic ones before we had a delay parameter to do the modeling. And our model just wouldn't have fitted well for this uh, example. And we're inferring a delay of around about 40 minutes uh, for this one. Um, there's some evidence of a delay here, but inference isn't certain about that. No delay in this guy. And then this is quite interesting because here the peak time of the RNA is later than the peak time of the Pol2. So Pol2 peaks at 80 and the RNA peaks at 160. But the model doesn't think that's due to a delay and it turns out that that RNA is just quite stable. So it has a long half-life and as I showed before, if you have a long half-life, your RNA peak will be delayed relative to your driving input. Polymer polymerase peak. So that's why we can't just do this work using peak times. We have to fit a model to account for the fact that there's RNA degradation as well as potential delays in the system. And so we found for about 11% of genes delays of longer than 20 minutes. So quite substantial delays for this subset. And then we looked at those genes to see if they had features which might explain this delay business. And um, we looked at gene length because I was a bit worried about confounding with elongation time. Because even though we're just looking at the last 20% of the gene, some genes are pretty long, so elongation can still take a bit of time. So I really didn't want the delayed genes to be long. And it turns out that actually the delayed genes tend to be short. So delay genes tend to be much shorter than other genes uh, on average, or rather short genes are much more likely to be delayed. And we also found that these delay genes were more likely to have a longer final intron relative to um, the other introns. So short genes with relatively long introns tend to be more likely to be delayed, and, and that suggested that there might be some relationship to splicing in these delays. Um, because you can imagine that um, for short genes, transcription, elongation, is very quick. probably takes about two minutes. But short genes can still have a lot of introns and a lot of structure, and you still have to splice them out. So maybe the rate-limiting step for short genes, in many cases, becomes splicing rather than elongation. So you might transcribe and then have to complete splicing while you've reached the end of the transcribed region. So to test that, we looked at the intronic reads in our RNA-seq data to see if there's any signal for intron retention in the delayed genes. And we did find that. So we found that delay genes were more likely to have an increased ratio of late intronic reads compared to early intronic reads at later times. So we sort of came up with an index which was to do with the relative ratio of late and early introns at two different times, early and late times. And we found that delay genes were more likely to have a kind of increased retention of late introns at late times suggesting that for a good proportion of these delayed genes, there is some kind of uh, delay while splicing completes. So how important is that in terms of cellular dynamics? Well, elongation time is still the longest time for most genes, but we estimate that for about 13% of genes, this delay is bigger than the time to elongate. And it's quite an interesting kind of delay because it's probably something the cell can regulate. Elongation time is mainly determined by the length of the gene. And genes can have different lengths through alternative promoters, but most of them just use the same promoter most of the time. So they're probably elongating for about the same time in most cell types. But anything involving splicing can probably be regulated because you can choose different splice sites, you can splice out different isoforms. They may make proteins which are functionally very similar, 
but by choosing different ways of splicing out, you can probably induce these kinds of delays in the system. So it might be that this is more cell type specific, this kind of delay, compared to an elongation delay. Even individual specific, perhaps. Um, so that's kind of hypothesis. So we are looking at different systems now to see if we can really perturb things to change these delays. Oh, and um, technical note is that we are also inferring a time-bearing degradation because in that previous model, uh, we showed that the inference of the delays was pretty robust to changes in degradation rate. But changes in degradation rate can give you a very different response in this kind of model. So here's a degradation rate which goes up sharply and then reduces down. And if you have this kind of degradation rate, you can get this incredibly sharp kind of dynamics <coughs> and then maintain your mRNA at kind of a high level later on by switching off degradation. So you can get a kind of step function like response by having a regulated degradation rate, which might be quite useful in a kind of uh, systems biology scenario. But it's quite technically hard to put it into the Gaussian process framework. And finally, how am I doing for time? OK. Um, <coughs> I'm not getting a number. I'm just getting none. <laughs> and you're going to shake your head in one minute. <laughs> OK, right. I'm OK. Fine. Um, Oh, that's good, actually, because this bit always I have to skirt through quite quickly. So, um, so finally, I'm going to talk about inferring regulatory networks. Um, so in the first, um, first application, I talked about how um, this elongation dynamics has, uh, sort of at the beginning, a promoter activity profile. So the promoter kind of uh, can have different activity profiles. And I looked to see whether that profile was related to transcription factor binding. Okay, so transcription factors kind of control the switching on and off of genes. And so really what we'd want to do is take those promoter profiles and then try and do inference over the transcription factor dynamics regulating those target genes. So that's kind of where we wanted to go with that work. And we haven't gone there yet, but I'm going to show some older work where we just looked at gene expression data and tried to solve that transcription factor target inference problem. And I think that this older work can be combined with that more recent work to solve this problem in high eukaryotic systems that we didn't apply it to in this uh, part. So we looked at Drosophila, and Drosophila genes tend to be much shorter. It's a much more compact genome than human. And so probably these elongation delays, they're there, but they're probably not quite as big a factor as in the human system. Um, OK, so regulatory networks are important because they tell us about how um, biological systems kind of control development through time. Um, and so here is uh, embryonic development in Drosophila. And these colored in uh, sort of nodes here are what are called master regulators. And that means that they have a lot of target genes which respond to their changes. Okay. And so if you know what these master regulators are do, doing over time, you can kind of work out what stage you're in in development here. So they give you a lot of information about what stage the embryo is in in developmental time. So they're highly informative about what stage it, we're in. And their target genes tend to be involved in lots of important functions at different stage of embryogenesis. <coughs> So the question we want to address here is, given some target gene expression data, can we work out what are the regulatory networks controlling the dynamics of the target genes 
given knowledge about these uh, master regulatory transcription factors. And we're going to do that with a sort of Bayesian model selection approach. So imagine that we somehow could infer the transcription factor protein levels in the nucleus. So the transcription factor gets activated, goes into the nucleus, and switches on transcription. Now, that's hard to measure, uh, but let's say we've inferred it. So I'll show you how we infer it later. So we have inference of this transcription factor called BAP. And then we have inference about this transcription factor, MEF2. And we have three models of regulation. Either BAP can regulate this target gene here, or MEF2 can regulate this target gene, or maybe BAP and MEF2 regulate that target together through some kind of uh, uh, nonlinear combination. And we want to score all those different alternatives. Um, so we basically can build a model for those three scenarios. And the model will probably have a low evidence for this guy because the data doesn't match. So this is the best you can do with our regulation model for BAP. And it's not a very good fit to the data. MEF2, you can do much better. You can fit the data quite well. BAP and MEF2 together, you can fit the data even better. However, the BAP and MEF2 model contains the MEF2 model as a special case, because you can just switch off the parameter relating to BAP. So we know that BAP and MEF2 is going to do at least as well in terms of least squared fit for this data here. So what we need is a way of taking into account that additional model complexity in order to do model selection, penalizing for the fact that that model is more flexible. So Bayesian model selection allows us to do that by integrating over the space of parameters in the model. So if you have a more high dimensional parameter space, you're going to be kind of penalized by the additional flexibility of your model. So if I do model selection, probably both these models are going to be reasonable. But then there's fairly low probability, or there's fairly low support for BAT being involved, because you know, if both of these models are equally scored, then there's a probability one that MEF2 is involved, but only a probability half that BAP is involved. So I can kind of marginalize over all the models in order to ask questions about specific transcription factor regular, regularization. So how do I do this with Gaussian processes? Well, we're going to assume here that, and this seems to be reasonably OK for this particular developmental system, that the transcription factor pro protein is produced by translation from the transcription factor mRNA. So we're not going to model phosphorylation and activation in this model. We're just going to say that the mRNA of the transcription factor protein produces a, a transcription factor protein with some rate. So this is the translation of the transcription factor protein from the transcription factor mRNA. And then the protein has some degradation rate. So the protein has some stability. The target mRNA is then produced in proportion to this transcription factor. So here is just linear activation with a single TF. I'm going to generalize it to multiple TFs. But this is a nice example because it's exactly tractable. And then each target has a different stability DI. So I is the index for each target gene of this transcription factor. Going to model this F here as a Gaussian process because we don't have any information uh, or we have noisy data about that, but it's kind of a latent variable. And then we can fit that. So let's look at this single TF example. <coughs> 
So we have twist data here. And blue here is the fitted model. So this is uh, optimizing the hyperparameters and just fitting the GP using Bayesian regression. And then these are three potential targets. Now these two targets look quite different because this one has more stable mRNA than this one. So the stability of the target mRNA can change the shape of the targets. But there's no way for this inferred protein to fit this guy here. So we can basically take known targets and include them in our model and then test unknown targets by adding them into the model and then scoring them to see how well they fit and then discarding them if we can't fit them given the kind of known targets. So we need a few known targets to fit this kind of model. But in this case, we do have a few well-known targets for each of these transcription factors. OK. And then we, we applied this single TF model uh, in this paper. Now, if you have multiple TFs, you can't assume a linear model anymore. Um, because a linear combination of TFs isn't sufficient to really capture how TFs behave. So they have kind of nonlinear relationships. And so we use a kind of sigmoidal function to capture that nonlinear relationship of uh, transcription factors. But we basically do the same thing. We, we have a small number of known targets. Um, so these are well characterized the binding of the transcription factor is close to the promoter, so it's unambiguous, and they've been validated experimentally. Um, and we use that to train a model to infer these transcription factor protein profiles. And then we do a prediction phase genome-wide and scan every potential target gene in the genome to see which of these possible models of regulation um, scores the best. And we do model averaging over the links of these networks. So uh, to work out the probability that this transcription factor regulates this gene, we average over the models weighted by their evidence that contain this link. Okay, so this one, this one, this one, and this one, we would score and work, work out the probability of that link. And so we had some nice validation data for this uh, because there was some high quality chip seek data for modeling transcription factor binding in this system. And uh, we, did, we did very nicely on that. But um, the referee didn't, didn't kind of like that because we had access to that data through the whole process of developing these models. And you can become kind of biased by things you know over time. You know? So the referees were a little bit unhappy and asked us to validate on um, an independent database that didn't contain evidence from those experiments. And when we did that, that was actually the best validation that we got out of all the validation we did. Um, so it's a bit of a shame it happened in the revision stage of the paper. If we'd done it in the first place, uh, it would have made the paper a lot nicer. And we basically did a lot better than other competing kind of methods for this problem. Um, and there's lots more validation in the paper. So this works quite nicely if you have a small number of known regulatory transcription factors. It doesn't really scale to genome-wide transcription factor networks where you have hundreds of transcription factors. And that's a big challenge moving into uh, higher eukaryotic human kind of systems. Um, but I think we can, we can probably do things along these lines. We just have to use different inference over the networks rather than exhaustive model scoring over all potential networks. OK, so that's kind of three examples of how we're using Gaussian processes for time course data. Um, elongation dynamics was used to infer the time it takes for a gene to transcribe using polymerase data. The nice features of the model were that we didn't assume constant velocity. And 
we could deal with kind of spreading out the signal over time as the cells become desynchronized, which is quite a nice feature. mRNA production model was used to identify these significant delays in transcription, which we think are associated with the time required to splice out. Um, and the nice feature there is that you can do full inference over all the parameters of the model. And the parameters, the number of parameters required isn't too big. Whereas if we'd had to parameterize the functions with parametric forms, we would have ended up with quite a few extra parameters, which would have made fitting quite hard. Um, and finally, um, these two processes are regulated in some way. And the promoter activity is primarily regulated through transcription factor binding. So I showed older work where we were actually learning which transcription factors regulate which target genes by doing Bayesian model scoring and using the same kind of Gaussian process uh, tricks. And really, the underlying trick here for all these methods is that any kind of linear uh, transformation of a Gaussian process is, again, a Gaussian process. And so all the likelihoods that I've talked about were exactly tractable, which means that you can just deal with the hyperparameter inference uh, for a small number of hyperparameters and do something like MCMC, and it's tractable. And this is kind of a, the summer school is about personalized medicine, so what's the link? Well, um, what we're doing now in a collaboration with some immunologists is we're measuring time course of stimulated T cells from humans and trying to characterize enhancer and promoter dynamics and trying to work out regulatory networks for how enhancers are bound by TFs which then regulate promoters. And the plan there is to integrate that modeling then with GWA data for the diseases that we're interested in to see whether we can identify causal SNPs. Because GWA signal, you get a lot of um, kind of um, features, genomic features, which are associated with disease. But it's very hard mechanistically to work out which ones are really having a functional effect. So we want to use this kind of modeling of enhancer promoter dynamics to see whether SNPs lying in enhancer regions are genuinely causal. And we actually have some cohort data where we can do, for instance, uh, chip seek on blood from patients to see whether enhancers are affected by uh, changes in SNPs. And we're also going to do sort of uh, genomic uh, CRISPR experiments in the same system. So we're not doing personalized medicine with this stuff yet, but I think uh, there's a big move in biology to make this kind of modeling much more relevant to real um, disease cohorts. And that's it. Thanks.